I'm your host, Shane Trotter, and today I'm very excited to welcome back my friend, Justin Lind. Justin, as always, it's great to see you. It's great to see you, too. Well, first, can you give a little bit about your background for those of, uh, that, that aren't familiar, that haven't read uh, all your articles and, and kind of what you've been up to lately? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I guess I'll start by just, uh, just saying thank you for including me in this show, and um, I feel honored to, to be the first, uh, first discussion that you have in this whole, uh, this whole project. I think it's, uh, it's a really important discussion. I am a coach. I, I started kind of in the CrossFit world, but within there, um, I always say that CrossFit was my gateway into thinking about fitness and movement and all that. And since then, I've kind of come to specialize in kettlebells, kettlebells, excuse me, um, with uh, some heavy involvement in the RKC, and then also um, a specialty in gymnastics. I was uh, I was a youth gymnast and have done a lot of coaching for um, kind of recreational and competitive youth gymnastics and then also have a little bit of a gymnastics focus on uh, the way that I train and like to train people. And at the moment, uh, a lot of has changed in my life since, since last you and I spoke. I am doing this podcast from New Zealand, no longer <laughs> from California. <laughs> Uh, I've been here for a couple months and plan to be here another month and a half or so. I've just uh, kind of taken off and, I guess, taken my my show on the road, so to speak, and <laughs> just uh, just committed to doing a lot of travel. So um, at the moment, I don't have a regular gym home where I am coaching and doing that, but I'm continuing to train people online and then uh, continuing to teach workshops as I travel. I've done both kettlebell and handstand workshops since I've been in New Zealand here, um, still working with online clients and still contributing to Breaking Muscle, about to conclude a nine-week handstand video series. Um, that's the most recent stuff that I have had published on Breaking Muscle, and then after that will be a beginner pull-up series focused on helping people get their first strict pull-up. Wonderful. You have such a detail-oriented approach, uh, which I've always really appreciated. You've really started to create a pretty impressive library now of definitive pieces on certain exercises. I know that, that it, when I was training for my own RKC, uh, when I wanted to better understand the Turkish get-up, even though I'd read, a, you know, Pavel's Kettlebell Simple Center Stir and a, 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 quite a few kettlebell books, your article on the Turkish getup was the most illuminating. Uh, the same with your article on the press. Uh, yeah. And, um, you know, cer certainly a lot more layers became apparent to me uh, at the actual RKC, uh, which I just uh, did this past weekend, and you know, we'll talk about that. But uh, it, it, as, as far as conveying the most information in the clearest possible way through written word. Uh, you've done a very impressive job in, in, the, in the handstand uh, series as, uh, as videos as well. It's very impressive. Thank you. I mean, those are, those are some amazingly, amazingly kind words. It, mean, it means a lot to hear that period, but especially from, uh, from a coach and a human that I respect so much. So <laughs> thank, thank you for that. That's... Um, you know, I think of myself kind of more as a teacher than than a coach. I love I love the day-to-day -day stuff of working with people one-on-one, -on -one, and I love uh, teaching in the group class environment. But where what I most enjoy and where I really feel like I come alive in the fitness world is is in teaching, doing some of the workshops, and then articles and videos are a bit of an extension of that. So that's that's mm -hmm. that's where I would that's where I see I can offer the most value, and it's also where I enjoy enjoy spending most of my time. Um, in this whole fitness world, and doing these panel discussions is also an extension of that. So, I'm yeah. excited about what you're doing, and I'm super excited to be a part of it. So, you look into training as not just, hey, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to have this adaptation. It's uh, very skill oriented and very qualitative approach uh, versus, you know, a very very process qualitative oriented uh, and, and mindful approach versus looking for outcomes all the time, which I think in, in my own experience has led to a lot more enjoyment. Absolutely, yeah. I, uh, I like to think of almost almost everything as skill development. So if you are just focused on building the skill, and, and that 
that goes for strength as well. I mean, it's you mentioned Pavel earlier, and I think this idea is originally his, but thinking about strength as a skill, you know. So rather than going in with I have to hit X number of reps at X weight, all this kind of stuff, if you just go in and you're just thinking about today I'm practicing at the press or today I'm practicing at whatever the movement is, you're going to get stronger. There's, there's, there's just no way around it. Um, but if you just think about like I'm becoming a better presser, part of that is getting more smooth and more efficient with the movement and part of that is just the physical adaptation you're going to see by putting in those reps. So if you take the pressure off of I need to finish X numbers and sets and all that kind of stuff and just think about I'm practicing the press today, then you can't help but get stronger. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. This past weekend I was at the RKC. You know, that's what we did. We practiced, and the the understanding of what your body is doing and how a slight alteration, oh, I can really activate my lat here and pressing with my lat, it'll blow your mind, but you also put 20 pounds on a max press like that. Yeah, and I think I think my involvement with, with the RKC is, is probably the biggest factor that, that kind of uh, informs my training philosophy, just, just that that strength as a skill model or everything is just practice is really is really where that comes from and it's it's kind of why I've landed on the two areas that I like to focus on the kettlebells and the kind of calisthenics body weight gymnastics world it it's not an accident i mean i i like both of those fields of training i think they're fun and uh, lead to lead to great results but the biggest thing that appeals to me about them sort of why i've I had a much broader approach and tried all these things, and these are the two that have kind of risen to the top. Uh, for me, it's because they're the they're the two areas that that seem to engender that attention and that in intention the most. You can't help but be aware of how you move when you're doing these type of things. You know, I mean, try to mm -hmm. try to learn a handstand. There's you can't become a proficient handstander without deeply being in your body and having some awareness of how all the pieces are moving and kettlebell training tends to be the same way there's something about it's it's not a large weight but because it's not moving through your center line right like when we move barbells the barbells moving in a perfectly straight line that's the whole point is it stays it stays over your base the kettlebell is moving in all these different planes it's it's traveling over an arc and mm -hmm. it's it really never on, closed on, chain it's never closed chain, yeah, and it's um, and that's kind of the point is it's moving in all these arcs. It's it's going outside of your base of support, meaning your feet on the ground. It's loading one side of your body and the other, and it not only creates a unique training stimulus, but it also you have to be much more aware of how you're moving than you are with a barbell. And it's not to disparage barbell training at all. I mean, you look at high-level Olympic lifters, and those guys and girls are in their bodies. They are they are absolute specimens of athletic performance. But for the average person, I think the kettlebell demands that at a much earlier stage. Mm -hmm. um, and that that is one of the biggest benefits I think you can get from training is that is that physical awareness because that that tends to be a gateway into some 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 deeper kind of if you want to get emotional spiritual awareness all that kind of stuff that physical awareness is is kind of a gateway into understanding yourself on a deeper level and that I think is the beauty of kettlebell and gymnastics training not to take this to a super serious no, spiritual turn and all of that but it it's um when I when I when I really boil it down to what appeals to me about those styles of training that that's why it's not it becomes so much more than just a physical practice. Sure. You know, I, I've kind of landed in the same place as you have, but I meditated before that, and, and, and that was one thing that struck me is, wow, this is almost a moving meditation. And it's, a, you know, you, it's just a different approach. It's a, it's a really uh, far departure from the majority of fitness in the world today, which is so overly quantified, right. which, you know, we're, we're constantly anxiously tracking a billion metrics that possibly don't matter while losing any sort of direct line to our own biofeedback and how we're feeling and you know I can't eat just eating real whole you know nourishing foods I need to be counting my macros and have a food scale 
and you know, oh gosh, I hate this food that is isn't packaged. I never know how many calories it is, and <laughs> it's just right. these these crazy concepts uh, th that that can drive us wild and and really get away from the fact that you know health, uh, training, fitness should really be a very natural thing. It should be, yeah. And those those things that you talked about, the overly quantifying, counting macros, the weight on the bar, all these you know perfectly prescribed reps and sets and percentages and all of that, it is it is a tool. And if you have very 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 specific goals, it's kind of the most direct line to get you there. Or if you're just beginning to do something like that, it's a great way to drive some of that awareness in an earlier sense, like. I I recorded everything I ate. I I didn't weigh and measure, but um, just just kind of uh, eyeball quantitative analysis of everything I ate and drank and all that kind of stuff when I first got into the um, working out and especially coaching. And it's it was a great tool to develop kind of an innate sense of how I felt when I ate certain things, uh, relative portion sizes, all of that kind of stuff. Um, because I, I could look back and look at a record of I felt really great this day and I didn't feel great on that day and and it just it's uh it's it's nice to put it all out in front of you but then the point is not to do that forever I but I but I developed kind of an innate sense of what things make me feel good uh, what things make me feel a certain way relative portion size all of that so that I can take that awareness into not needing to weigh and measure and all of that and I kind of feel like the same can happen with. Uh, your movement practice too, you know, uh, just mm -hmm. in not needing to have this perfect set reps and percentages and all of that. But like I said, it it's a tool towards a specific goal. You know, likewise, when I train, when I train a fourteen year old freshman with very little experience, I'm much much more controlling of tempo, of of the whole nine yards of percentage, and then kind of go to a, a little bit more of a uh, choice driven adjustable to them and their and their level and their uh, what they're attracted to as they get get older let's jump into the, you know the concept of this show it's it's really it's built on a, a philosophy um, that, that that most of our community problems stem from not respecting our nature and this is something you and I've talked a lot about and one reason I really wanted to bring you on to start this um, but Chiefly, our natural incl inclinations for movement, nourishing food, and time outdoors away from digital stimulation. And I've written a great deal about the community role in fitness, how health, lifestyle change, how health and lifestyle change, uh, whether that's eating healthier, working out, etc., are far harder to do against the tide of co of a culture that doesn't value these things. That that we don't see that these have to be a community dialogue. Um, so it's it, it's made even more difficult by the failures of our education system to give people any sort of foundation in, in, in understanding of environmental patterns that don't serve people and much less any sort of competency in physical literacy or nutrition. Kind of this idea that that we're living in an environment that is not conducive to the needs of our biology and evolution. It creates a lot of human angst. So I wanted to, to kind of look at a lot of these these social issues and social concerns and why health needs to be the lens that we attack these issues from or at least one of the lens and, and kind of look at, at some of those modern issues today I wanted to mostly look at the, the rise in mass shootings um, that we've seen and how that might be a health uh, it's certainly a mental health uh, issue but uh, related to a lot of, uh, of, of health and fitness kind of ideas. So that's where we're going. You suggested to me a book called Tribe. Do you have any thoughts on just off the cuff about the general thesis of Tribe and how it might uh, illuminate some of the health related causes of the rise in mass shootings? Uh, I, yeah, I definitely have some thoughts. There's, there's a lot there. You know, this is, this, is, this is a pretty charged issue, so it's one of those things that you know, I feel like, on the one hand, I feel very compelled to want to weigh in and offer what I can in ways of solution, but 
also also come into it knowing that it's extremely nuanced and um, if you really go deep into the realm of mental health I mean I have a lot of thoughts on it but I also recognize that there's a lot of people that make this their full-time their full-time field of study and um, you know so I know that we enter into this conversation respecting um, the complexity and the nuance uh, and kind of the severity of, of, of all of this and I guess the biggest way that I think about this is that you can't really disentangle uh, mental and emotional health from physical health. I don't. I don't think it's impossible to, or I don't think it's possible to try to improve one of those areas without thinking, addressing, or trying to improve in all the other areas. You know, I think that they're all in, intimately. Connected, they are kind of the three aspects of our of our uh, our nature, I guess. You know, right? That mind, body, and spirit. So, if anything that that is a mental, emotional uh, health issue is, it, there's absolutely going to be a physical component. That I feel like I can I can say definitively how much how much of this kind of stuff can be solved with uh, strictly a physical practice I don't know but I guess that's that's what we're trying to explore today but so long-winded caveat as to our <laughs> our personal backgrounds uh, in all of this but you know going back to what you asked about tribe there's 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 some big takeaways from it and the biggest takeaway that I get from that is that humans in general, thrive on community and a sense of purpose and a sense of I don't want to say proving their worth but you know a little bit thriving on rites of passage and most of that comes to do with having a sense of purpose but also having your close-knit community around you recognize that sense of purpose um, so I think that we're we're lacking in two areas in that one a lot of people don't have that close-knit sense of community to even be able to recognize their their value and their sense of purpose and then and then you know the other side of that is that there's not a lot built into our society that becomes a rite of passage you know he talks about um, a lot of the Native American tribes you know the classic example is is the vision quest and all of that but even as simple as essentially uh, he talks about how natural disasters in times of war and crisis and that kind of stuff unites people um, under a common purpose and just that those those extreme stressful where all the other thoughts uh, pale in comparison to what what it is that you need to accomplish in this moment. Those type of opportunities used to kind of be built into daily life, whether it was you know going out on a hunt for the subsistence of your of yourself and your family and all your community, or times of war, natural disaster, all that kind of stuff. We have we have largely insulated ourselves from the dangers of those which is on the one hand fantastic you know we 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 all live pretty pretty long prosperous lives compared to millennia ago but we also don't reap the kind of life-giving benefits of having come through some deep trials so i guess that's my synopsis of of tribe yeah it's it, it's interesting the battle of britain he l looks at a, a ton of natural disasters the genocide in serbia and uh you know and he's been a war reporter sebastian younger the author of tribe we're talking about uh and consistently these people look back at all these trials very very fondly because they mattered they served a purpose and then when you look at the communities during that time depression consistently was almost eradicated mental disorder consistently was almost eradicated uh, because there is no social, social alienation when you're depending on people for survival right. and there is no lack of purpose when you are necessary to a group's survival and so you know that gets to right what you were, right where you were saying um, I want to frame this discussion a little bit more because we're not talking when we're talking about the rise in mass shootings it's it's certainly there it's not just a perception in the 1960s there was one school shooting in the 1980s there was 27 in the 1990s 58 
In our last decade, we've had 120. And, and these are overwhelmingly male mass murderers. So, you know, to, to frame this a little bit more, we have an environment that, that you and I would both agree is not 100% conducive to, to any humans, but in particular, it, it looks like here in America, males are really struggling. Struggling. There's some deep angst there. And Sebastian Younger kind of addresses that a little bit in Tribe as well. He goes as far as to say that, that he uh, became a war reporter because he had this, this feeling inside that he was not an adult because he'd never faced something that would, as he said, destroy him. Right. And a lot of people would think that's, that's very extreme, but if you look at history uh, and, and you know, what our, our, our evolution is probably was, was aligned for, this is what the initiation, initiation rites were for, to have young men face a daunting task and demonstrate that they would face the most painful or scary thing in the world for their community. And that doesn't exist anymore. I don't know that for sure that is what's, you know, this primary driving underlying cause, but I do think there's a lot of men who are lost, who are yeah. just completely lost and don't know how to be a man uh, in today's world. Absolutely. I mean, I think, um, I think first and foremost, the, the biggest issue is just in general, we are lacking the types of influences in our lives that humans really need, whether you're, whether you're male or female, you know, the senses of close knit community, um, our, our food, movement, sleep, all of uh, our connection to the natural environment, all of those type of things. We, we don't really have ready access to all the type of aspects that, that, that just a healthy human being needs to thrive. And if you, if you, you have to actively seek those out. They're not really built into the system, per se. And it's it's a little bit of, you know, it makes you a little bit of an outsider to actively want to seek those things, you know. You become a little mm -hmm. bit of a weirdo, which <laughs> um, I think you and I have both written about, you know. You kind of... <laughs> I think Ido Portal says it too, you know, be the weirdo. You have to be the weirdo if you want to uh, <laughs> want to be optimally healthy. So, you know, I think a lot of it is just that. It's 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 uh, on the ground level, it's not a specifically male issue. It's 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 a human issue. But then to take it one step further, the um, there are there are some aspects of the system that seem to be particularly, I guess, hostile to what males need to thrive and be optimally male to whatever uh, that means, you know, yes. and it, I think it starts pretty darn early. Like they, you know, you look at the rates at which el elementary school kids are diagnosed with ADHD and medicated for all that kind of stuff. And it's, I don't, I, I, I don't know the rates offhand, but it's something like four to one um, ADHD is diagnosed and medicated in boys as opposed to girls at a, mm -hmm. at, at a rate of four to one. And they're, 20 times more likely to be suspended or expelled from school, some large percentage more likely to be reprimanded or kicked out of class or disciplined in, sure. in some way. And I think that it is particularly difficult to, for, for men to, to sit or for young boys to sit and behave and sit in class and sit on their butts all day and, and uh, be calm and silent and that kind of stuff. Sure. Um, I think that that is a really good indicator that our systems are, in, in our expectations in school, are not aligned to the needs of boys. Uh, and I yeah. think that works its way up in society for grown men. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it starts, it starts pretty early on. You know, I have a little bit of personal experience in all of this and it's it's mostly when it came to coaching youth gymnastics so I've had used to have four or five classes a day of anywhere from uh, five or six to sometimes close to 20 kids and it was you know just just me with that number of kids and we we try to separate the boys and girls as early as possible um, once they develop a little bit of a baseline uh, gymnastic strength, mostly for the reason that if they are going to go into competitive gymnastics, they just are trained on different apparatus. 
Right? I mean, everyone does the floor and everyone vaults, but other than that, all the, the men's events are different from the women's events. So it's mostly just, just a, a feature of the type of tools that they're going to start learning, but just in the coaching style that I had to ad adopt and the way that you speak to them and managing the group and all that kind of stuff, a group of a dozen six-year-old girls is drastically different than a group of a dozen six-year-old boys. Um, so to to try to put them through the same system, when you just spend an hour or even a couple minutes with them, you see how drastically different they are in demeanor and the type of things that they're thinking about and how they are in their bodies. And they all all the kids are curious. All the kids want to move and explore and play and learn and all of that. But and I don't know if this is something that's socialized in already by this point in time, but sure. it's it's safer to say that at five and six years old, you're you're still getting more of a authentic more expression. Of, more more of an authentic expression of what a you know a young boy is and what a young girl is. By the time you get into later in the elementary school years and into middle school, I think you're seeing a higher percentage of what's been socialized in, but. Um, you know, I'm going to go under the assumption that that most of what I was observing in this is is innate to their nature. It, I, I mean, the boys are just they're little they're little monkeys, and it's not to say that the girls aren't aren't wanting to run around and play and all that kind of stuff. But the boys, it's like pulling teeth getting them to stand in line. You know, which which I get it. It would it would kind of tear me apart to to try to get them to stand in line and wait their turn to do something. All they want to do is run around and play on all this wonderful playground equipment essentially that's uh -huh. that, that fills a gymnastics gym and I can empathize I was uh, I was in my late 20s when I was doing this and all I wanted to do was run around and play you know so yeah uh, so to observe that and this is just one hour of the day and they and they couldn't stand not being able to run around and play and explore and to think about that all day every day most of most of what they do in school is this is they just have to sit in line or sit in their desk at an assigned place it's the same place every day oftentimes and and you know be for the most part silent and for the most part stationary it's i think we impose order and that kind of stuff far far too early and that that seems to be particularly damaging to young boys but you know, as you said, it's it's everyone to some degree in today's environment. Um, Absolutely. And I think what's what's missing in large part is play and movement at being respected as a not just integral piece in youth development, youth mental development, youth cognitive development, but also adult development. Uh, and I think that we're we're eradicating it earlier and earlier. With the mobile phone generation, uh, we're seeing even more issues stem from this increased sedentarism. A couple of stats that jump out: one in five children today have mental health have a mental health disorder. Uh, Forty-three yeah. percent increase in ADHD diagnoses uh, in the last ten years. Thirty-seven percent increase in teen depression, and a two hundred percent increase in suicide rates for kids between ten and fourteen. Like you were saying, it sure boys. Are, are probably struggling even more than girls, but there is uh, just an environment that is not conducive to physical and mental health, and the two are deeply interrelated. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, I don't know what the numbers are exactly, uh, but that um, that suicide statistic jumps out to me. If it's it's a huge increase in the number of total suicides, but if you look at the ratio of you know young boys and young girls that are committing those suicides, I think by the time it's high school age, it's 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 more than 10 to 1 boys over girls that are yeah. committing suicide. So the fact that there's been an increase in teenagers taking their own life is just, is, is just absolute, the, the fact that enough has gone wrong or enough is missing in their lives in the first 15 years to to drive them to that point is such a giant indicator that something is missing and and then if you look at the ratio of of how it's you know boys to girls um, it, it it's also immediately apparent that there is something particularly missing for the boys and it could be that young boys are just much more prone to taking that drastic step, right? I know that men in general are more prone to rash decisions and that kind of stuff. 
and especially when you're in your teenage years, you know those those um, kind of cognitive abilities are, are are a little bit more underdeveloped, right? You're still a little bit raw, and you're particularly prone to um, impulsive and rash behavior. So it could be that they aren't depressed at a higher rate, but they just take that sort of extreme action at a higher rate. But I think some of the depression numbers suggest that boys are uh, diagnosed at a much higher rate with uh, with depression in those teenage years. I remember very well in the sociology class learning how the the biggest risk factor of suicide was social alienation. And, and so we saw more suicides in very sparsely populated places where there were a lot more men living alone typically. You know, this goes right in line with these themes that, that, that we're talking about. It needing a purpose and needing a community, not a, you know, a social network, uh, certainly. Uh, th th there's, there's not a, a real feeling of connectedness and authenticity within social media, M needing real people who have your back, who have, and this is where rites of passage, I think, really come in and, and have, sometimes they have a negative connotation, but they are so powerful and yet they create shared values and they create shared experiences that drive people together, that, that create bonds. Um, and if they're the right rites of passage, they can be so powerful uh, for society. And, 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 you know, there's all these negative connotations that surround these things. Toughness gets a bad rap. Toughness is a problem when boys feel like they have to posture as too tough all the time and they can't show real emotion and they can't, you know, hug another guy and actually connect. But toughness is also, take it from me, I've never seen a more full training room. Uh, you know, a football player gets a bruise and he thinks he's going to be out for three weeks. Toughness and, and being able to withstand physical adversity is really a, a necessary component of a happy life. Uh, otherwise, you're going to be not inclined to, to exercise, to move your body, uh, to you know correct any mobility issues. To I mean, you 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 need a degree of physical toughness, really, just not to perceive every physical malady as just this unfair sentence that's been been laid upon you. It's so. true. You know, I guess it just comes down mostly to how you define toughness because um, I think Certainly. what you were saying is that you know toughness gets a bad rap because it's construed as just you know you don't need to express it suck it up deal with it yourself man up as an expression comes to yeah. mind you know all of that kind of stuff um, as as though an inherent feature of maleness or of um, manhood is that you deal with things yourself and all of that so um, I think that's where we get into some of the societal things that that are particularly hostile to boys, but like you said, toughness that's that's not actual true toughness. You know, exactly. Um, it's, posture. it's yeah, it's a it's a it's a false sense of what it actually means to be tough. And I think true toughness is to acknowledge how difficult something is and be able to express that and fully feel that and then and then to lean into it and to push your way through it rather than to act like nothing is wrong to pretend that that you aren't feeling challenged or feeling some adversity is uh is different than acknowledging it and expressing it and then and then finding ways maybe with community support or maybe it is more of a solo endeavor to push through it but pretending that you don't feel it in the first place um, or that it's no big deal is, um, I think, is a huge problem with, uh, with how we or, or, or how many boys grow up defining what they think they should be when it comes to toughness. To a large degree, boys who are genuinely tough or you know, confident in their ability to withstand adversity and well-adjusted probably aren't doing all this posturing. It, 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 it's probably coming from some place of needing acceptance and not knowing how to find it. I was just going to say, I think the reason how some of this develops is that, and I, I don't think it's this conscious conspiratorial thing against boys. I think it's just this innate 
thing, and it, it comes from so many different places, but the reason why this kind of an idea develops is that the people that do naturally exhibit those type of qualities tend to be elevated and celebrated for those so that, so that then people think mm -hmm. that that is the optimal. We're just valuing those, those type of qualities, in, even if it's just um, uh, subconscious or uh, unconsciously elevating um, the type of boys that exhibit that type of stuff, glorifying uh, sports performance and physicality and all of that kind of stuff over, over some other just genuine expressions of, of who a, a person might be. But also, we, you know, to to get back, we need to respect the differences, the and, and, and the, the the natural inclinations, rather than demonizing the natural inclinations of of boys. I know that that in my experience, and then from what I've read, boys are more like girls are more likely to want to read in school books about feelings and relationships and kind of an internal dialogue that's going along, where boys want they want action. Uh, they want adventure. They want they, they like nonfiction, and they they tend to like comics. And these don't they don't they don't surface in school near as much. So mm. boys are less likely to be readers. And then you get back to play. We all need play. We all need physical physical uh, outlets our whole life. Um, I, adults need play, uh, and I think that that's where there's real potential to uh, to help alleviate adult mental disorders is is by offering more outlets for them to play and join communities uh, that 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 promote that these things are are real necessities for the development at a young age and going forward of everyone but very very uh, important for boys yeah absolutely I think um, getting onto the the play topic I it's actually something that I have written about in the past and I think the the main there's two main I guess features benefits of play which even calling them that uh, sounds sounds a bit backwards because it's it's kind of um, antithetical <laughs> to what I think play should be right sure. but if if we're if we're analyzing it and looking at, at at what play really is I think the I think first and foremost it's just doing something that the sole purpose is fun rather than to accomplish any particular end and then you know, hidden in that is this process of self-discovery. And that could be in more intellectual things or it could be in more physical things, but you are, rather than something being shown to you or the direction of your learning being carefully prescribed as it is in any type of class environment, it's more of a explore. Naturally, things are going to arise, be they physical challenges or any sort of cognitive thing and then you need to find your own way through it and that that self-discovery is really the the deepest mechanism and, and kind of the only true mechanism that we that we fully learn things you know and it, that was kind of the you you can emulate people that have come before you and watching watching the older kids or watching other adults or that kind of stuff but really that discovering your own way through it and and especially when it comes to physical things finding that own that own way through it in your body is such a such a valuable feature of any physical practice that is not really built into most of most of how we teach physical education or any any sort of education people aren't encouraged to explore and discover the type of things that that will naturally arise as you just try lots of different things even more, it's not as readily available for kids just in their their upbringings at home. Um, there's kind of been a movement towards this helicopter parenting model, uh, where parents almost compete and shame each other into never be having a moment where they aren't right over their kids. And I know this isn't everything we're talking about today is general trends, not not every parent, but uh, you know there is this conscious we don't just let them play we monitor everything we do Ooh, they could get hurt doing that stop them there stop them there stop them there uh, we want to keep them inside under under thumb where we know they're safe uh, we don't want them playing anywhere or going out and exploring with their friends we'd rather just shuffle them from 
sport expert to sport expert or you know select team to select team second grade select team to se second grade select team uh, where we know they're going to be monitored and it's not play it's right. it's not it's not a it, creative expression it's it's not a undirected experience and you know you touched on something that i think is we see it in in the general kind of social trend, but also in the school system, and that is it's not play. They're going from sports team to sports team, or this this prescribed activity to that prescribed activity. Whether you know, it's like we've got ballet practice, and then the next night karate, and then the next night soccer, or whatever it may be. There's there's there, there, there's a lot of physically focused and non physically focused things that they are that are a main feature of kids' lives rather than just this go outside and play, you know, get your hands in the dirt, like just go in the backyard and be there until it's dark, you know. Sure. Um, and that is, we see that in kids' home lives, but it also has kind of become a feature of the school system um, where it's something like you and I just just uh, both watched The Motivation Factor, which mm -hmm. amazing movie, and I guess this is a, a good time to get into some of that stuff, um, talking about how the PE system has uh, either fallen out completely or very, very deeply changed from what it used to be. And it's something like only 22% of states have a have mandated PE, and within those 22% of states, or maybe it's 22 total states, not 22%, 22 of the 50 states have mandated PE, and, and of those, most of the kids aren't actually getting the prescribed time, and the ones that are, it is of a sport-specific model rather than a mm -hmm. rather than a general physical preparedness model. And this is kind of one place where we can actually look at specifics to where I think larger societal trends have developed, but this is a place where we can actually track it and isolate the one variable. So when you have a sport-specific model, there's there's not a whole lot of genuine play. It's just it's just go out and you learn this game. They talk about this is the rules of basketball. They split you off into groups, and for that hour of the day, if you even get one hour, hour a day, you're sure. just playing basketball this week, and then the next week it goes to some other game or whatever which is which is fantastic but what we're doing in that is a confining the movement practice to this one specific field and they do try to vary it week by week month by month however um, the games are cycled but also what we're doing in that is there's not really a pathway to 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 see deep physical development all that happens in that is that the people, um, boys and girls, that are more naturally athletically inclined tend to succeed, and everyone else loses the will to participate. And I, and I say that fully as a beneficiary of that system. I was a pretty athletic kid, and like, I loved PE because it was a chance to go out, and rather than playing soccer against everyone that knew how to play soccer, it was it was you know you you and a couple good friends against against just all the rest of the kids in the class. So it was just They're an hour a day that, that that you get to go out and be the star. And for me, it was a positive experience. But I also am able to look back and recognize that for a vast majority of kids, it was it was not a positive experience. And what they talk about in the motivation factor is that physical education in the early days and when 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 they created it was was actually just that physical education it was teaching you general fitness oriented skills and no matter who you were you were just working on this general physical fitness and there was tests and all of that and no matter how naturally inclined towards that you were there was actual measurable improvement there was actually a path to say look I'm I, I'm here uh, or I was there now I'm here and rather than the sport model, like if you just go out and you just scrimmage a, a basketball game against a sure. bunch you know, with all these different kids, like there's not really anything to measure getting better if you even are improving because you're probably not really fully participating. But sure. if, it's, if it's just general physical preparedness model, it's just like being a part of any sort of training plan. And you know as well as most people listening, coaches and athletes alike, um, that no matter who you are, if you if you really do something physical, something that, that that's just general training, you always improve, no matter who you are. 
Um, so you can always look back and see some personal progress, even if it doesn't compare to, say, the person next to you. Mm-hmm. So no system's going to be perfect. Like people have innate uh, physical abilities more so than others, but there's always going to be a path to measure that improvement. And somewhere along the lines, we change from a general fitness model to a sport-specific model. You know, getting more specialized and more glo- and and that's that's where that inherent bias of glorifying um, and elevating the people that tend to be naturally inclined towards that, rather than a system that's built upon kind of the needs of everyone. The system they have that you know at La Sierra High School is kind of your and the motivation factor. And and I, I interviewed Doug Orchard, the director, and Ron Ron uh, Ron Jones. Um, on this, uh, so so for people yeah. listening and interested in this, there's a whole podcast on that. One of the interesting things there is there were different colored shorts for different uh, levels and different you know people who could accomplish. So there's this there is this motivation factor intrinsic, but there also was a community atmosphere. These boys supported each other. It was a system. They all understood the underlying philosophy of personal improvement, of understanding, of, of, of gaining a sense of uh, physical literacy, and of binding together to help each other be their best person. That was just kind of a part of this system. People might look at from the, the outside and say, you know, different shorts for different le- level. That that seems like you're going to to be isolating those n- not as naturally inclined. But that the proof's in the pudding. That's not what happened. Uh, w- what happened is that that everyone there, almost to to the man, looked back on it as this unbelievable experience where they learn to learn from their fellow classmates, buy into a system, buy into a, to a, a, a belief in the power of training their body, and work towards a goal, improve themselves, and they all look back on it. Uh, you know, Doug Orchard and Ron Jones said, you know, in interviewing all these people that had been through this system, they all, uh, to a man, would say, when I face trials in my life, I thought back to the lessons I learned at La Sierra High School. And that's, that's an important reminder, I think, for people. There's a saying uh, in education, you know, we often do the opposite, but you don't want to shape the, child for the, or shape the path for the child. You want to shape the child for the path. And it's important to remember that everyone's path is going to be full of adversity, and giving them a framework for overcoming that is, uh, and, and, and a confidence that they can and they have the tools to do so is, is, right. is really the ticket. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, um, they actually, talking about the, the levels and the different colored shorts and all of that, one of the main criticisms of this program at its inception, because it was, it was basically developed by um, this one particular uh, PE teacher at, uh, at La Sierra, Stan, remember his name, Stan Laprati, something like that? Laprati, um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I've got but anyways, my, uh, La Sierra manual right here. <laughs> there you go. Right. But anyways, one of the main critiques at the inception of this program is that you're going to you're going to see a natural separation by those that are more physically inclined, um, and that's going to create discouragement and um, alienation for the for the kids that don't progress as quickly or as far through these levels. So what they did is they interviewed a lot of these kids, and particularly the ones that had only, you know, remained at the lowest level or the ones that had only advanced one level instead of three or four by their junior or senior year, and you didn't find discouragement. They had they had a pretty healthy understanding of, you know, I feel encouraged, I feel celebrated in the uh, progress that I have made, and they were just striving striving to be better within whoever it is that they were rather than um, being discouraged by the people that were achieving the higher levels. But they also had a statistic that out of the hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of kids that entered this program, it was only two out of several hundred that never, never advanced a level within their four years. So that's that's just proof that if you have that type of a model that is just focused on general fitness and preparedness and lifelong fitness, that within that system, everyone has measurable improvement. So the benefit of this type of a system is that 
everyone is going to be celebrated for whatever progress it is that they make. And that's the that is the thing that we need to celebrate. Rather than rather than looking at the absolute level that everyone achieves, the fact that they all moved forward and they all improved where they were, and the fact that they can see that and measure that and they're recognized in that, they get to they get to put on a different shirt or different color shorts or a stripe yes. on your a stripe on your shorts or a star on the back of your shirt or something. The fact that that you are recognized for the progress that you've made, that that is where the beauty of this system lies. Rather than you know we we all played basketball for a week and no one passed me the ball and you know <laughs> I I hate PE I'm I'm sure. I'm not good at my hobby. If we have parents uh, listening, th- th- there's a really crucial point there to make. Uh, Carol Dweck did a study on this very thing what you praise and how that has a, a, an impact on those people uh, that you're praising. And it was with a group, I'm not sure, second or third grade, uh, basically two groups, uh, one being praised for effort and one being praised for how smart they were. Um, right. So basically she gives easy math problems to both groups and all the while while they're having all the success, one group uh, in a different room is being being consistently praised for being so smart. The next group consistently is being praised for you guys are working so hard, you're giving such great effort. All right, I can see that you guys just want to improve, uh, that, that, that you're willing to persist uh, and, and keep working so hard no matter how hard the problem is. That was the feedback they got. So the next day, same groups, the group that was praised for how smart they were is now presented, both groups are actually presented with much more challenging problems, far more challenging problems, way above level. Right. Ones that they're not not intended to be able to complete and something that's going to be naturally discouraging. Exactly. So the group that was praised for being smart, well now this image they had of being smart is being threatened. Now they're afraid. Oh gosh, I'm not going to be smart anymore. This should, this is I'm no longer smart. And they quit, and they get angry, and decide they don't like math. Just overwhelmingly, uh, you know, the, the majority of the kids quit way earlier. The other group, within the time given, there were no quitters. They were praised for effort the day before, and they were determined. Right? They were seeking that same praise, probably, but they were determined to keep their efforts consistent. So it's and they had better results. Exactly. So I think this is this this should be like required reading uh, for every parent, every teacher. <laughs> I mean, it's a huge concept. Uh, yeah. How we how we shape um, and reward our students, our youth, your workers, employers should think about this. How you shape, how you give feedback to people is going to have a great influence on how they how they act. Yeah, and and you know. Adults respond just the same way as well. I uh, I love that you brought Carol Dweck into this. I think I think she calls this growth versus fixed mindset. Yes. Where one is you know one you're supported for the growth that you have, the progress that you've made, and it's implied that you are going to continue to make progress. Whereas the other the other way of giving that praise is saying that you you are this you are this quality. This is a fixed thing about you. It's part, and, and then it becomes part of your identity. So rather than you know you are smart or you are good at basketball or you are you are this thing, it's it's not you. You have performed this way because of the growth that you've made. So one implies that you're that it's one effort based, but um, also just going. It's bound to continue if you continue the the input. And one is just a fixed piece of your nature. And then you get just as you said, fearful and. Um, more concerned with maintaining that image and that identity rather than the continual improvement. Um, and that's that's exactly what I think was the underlying feature of this La Sierra PE program was one one was growth oriented. It's like, look, no matter who you are, everyone improves. We're, we're, we're going to encourage that growth no matter at, at the rate um, that it comes rather than just like, okay, everyone go play basketball. And I mean, if the teacher doesn't give any feedback, it's just very clear who is good at X and who is not um, sure. on that on that day, you know. Sure. Even if they are still playing basketball. Uh, I mean, th- th- there are plenty of PE horror stories. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, from, that's true. From, from just dressed out walking tracks to, to like you said, to not even having a PE requirement in many states. 
uh, or for those states that do, it's one semester of freshman year possibly every other day. This is not sufficient for the needs of a human being. Uh, and, it, and it gives no framework for because nearly everybody at one point in their life gets interested and wants to make a positive health change. Nearly everybody. And yet, they don't have a framework for how to do it. They do not know. They, they, and that's why we, we have so, so many interesting, for lack of a better word, fitness fads that come into vogue over and over again. Um, you know, so many people that begin diets and crash after months and then just decide that this, this lifestyle isn't for them. Um, there is no sort of framework uh, for going forward. Uh, for how but, to get started, or or just they they don't have the the background they they didn't have the ability to learn that if I just stick with something and I progress I'm going to I'm going to improve because because that was never built into their early education. I was just gonna say we've kind of drifted away from the you know the depression and mass shooting issue and 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 all of that and. We've obviously been touching on just 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 how the needs of of what it takes to be a healthy human like aren't really being addressed. But I was just going to add that one of the things that's also built into this uh, general general preparedness model of PE, which which really should be kind of a general preparedness model of um, of education, is that. It's all just focused on improving from where you're at, and there's a lot of encouragement from the whole group. So you do, even though everyone is getting to different levels and performing differently on a given task, there's encouragement and celebration for how far you have come. So that that just engenders a lot of community support and feeling like you're a part of something. You know, and it's one of those. It's one of the things that I that I think CrossFit should be most celebrated for. Actually, is just bringing that that growth mindset and that community celebration aspect into into a group fitness environment. Um, it's it's I think probably the greatest feature that CrossFit has brought to the fitness world um, because you actually feel a part of something, and that's what those La Sierra. Um, and other PE programs of the time were were all about. So that that addresses that community connection piece of it as well. Yes, no doubt. No, I mean, and, and, and that's really the case with most really good fitness gyms and, and, and fitness, the RKC, uh, w w whatever it is. I, I think of uh, Sean Griffin, who I interviewed uh, a while ago, and my goodness, he's doing such a great job of fostering community of kind of leading people down a path of daily improvements and, and support. You know, he brings people in, they break down any of these kind of social barriers. They're they're doing a warm up where they're crab walk foot foot fiving and all of a sudden <laughs> you've got this amazing atmosphere uh, where a general population is learning get ups. Is, you know, learning a Turkish get up in the gen general population uh, that's tough, <laughs> but they're all yeah, doing it and they're loving it. And uh, they don't come in because they have any concept of, well, I need to be a kettlebeller. They come in because the community, because that's what their that's what their biology, that's what their evolution is starving for. Um, Absolutely, yeah. They come because of their goals, but they stay because of the connection. That's um, right. And from everything uh, Sean says in that interview it seems like he does an amazing job of that for for anyone that hasn't listened to that that's one of my favorite breaking muscle podcasts so go back and check that one out so yeah. we've been all over the place uh, you know I guess the <laughs> major theme is we have an environment that does not respect the natural biological and evolutionary uh, needs of the human and if there's any takeaway uh, it's that this has to be a community dialogue, whether this is to uh, improve mental health in high school age kids, whether it's to meet the needs better of, of, of all our kids, or whether it's to address these the, the mental health that is at the core of this rise in mass shootings. We clearly have an increasingly poor environment for our 
needs. Um, and I think the, the rise in mass shootings is just evidence of that. Yeah, and the biggest the biggest thing that I think is missing is just is just this sense of connection or relationship. And that means relationship with a community and feeling connected and a part of something. I know that whether it whether it tends to drive depression or e extreme acts like this or or just a general feeling of disconnection, it seems like Americans in particular, that's that's the only country that I think you and I can speak of in detail is um, is just feeling feeling uh, not really a part of something. This whole kind of just national identity and what it means to be an American and feeling connected to something greater that that that's at an all time low in our uh, in our country. And I don't mean to turn this political. It has nothing to do with recent administration. I think that this is a trend that has been growing stronger for a long time. Certainly in my adult political memory, which is the last three administrations or so, mm -hmm. you know, just in just in my political, uh, socially aware memory, this seems to be getting strengthened. And I also talk about my, I talk to my parents about this and just feeling like, do you, you know, think back to when you were my age or even, even um, when you were in your 40s or so, do you... Did you have was there a general sense amongst you and your peers that your representatives genuinely represented you or that the government generally had your best interest at heart because I can speak for myself and the general sense that I feel amongst my peers and we don't feel that way we don't have the the general idea that our government our representatives all that kind of stuff has our general best interest at heart and I think that, that that's a that's a big piece of all of this. Unfor like I bring this up with the unfortunate feature that I don't have a suggestion for how that changes. Um, unfortunately, you know, so it's it's pointing to a problem with with a a real complex solution. But this is it that tends to be a big part of it. It's just the feeling of um, disenfranchisement amongst um, amongst our generation that that feels much stronger than say our parents generation certainly th th there is a uh, belief and it's not just even political it's you know the, the we believe that every corporation is extremely self-interested and that no one is really looking out uh, or, or, or doing things for the public interest uh, and that's a really tough place to come from because I think it leads to social alienation because there's now uh, a development of a belief that well I need to take care of myself because no one else is everyone is self-interested you know there's there's been a rise of a lot of different minority groups from from every type of minority racial political um, sexual orientation all this kind of stuff wanting to hear their voices heard and have their needs addressed and I and I think that that's a that's a beautiful feature of our time and should be that 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 should be the main thing that we are addressing when it comes to progress and moving forward but also some of these movements or at least some of the individuals that are the most outspoken within them tend to have a an idea that a victimhood or b that we I say we as in like the people within the movement and the people that the movement is trying to communicate to or have their or have their voices heard to that there is more difference between us than similarities mm -hmm. right there's there's this like right. you you have to understand me otherwise my needs are going to be met but you're incapable of understanding me right mm -hmm. like you have to you have to see my identity but it's impossible for you to actually understand where I'm coming from. It's like okay, well, that doesn't that doesn't serve anyone, and um, the the sense of being a part of something greater um, seems to seem to have been lost. Right, the sense of being you know an American or part of you know a a larger whole group is less valued than your identity to this smaller smaller group that that. And and then and then it tends to be you know this victimhood like it's 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 us this small group being oppressed by this larger mass group which 
it's it's not. I don't criticize anyone for having that view, um, because it's easy to point to uh, instances of injustice, no matter what they are, and it's easy to see how you can how you can have that general feeling and not feeling like this this group at large has your best interest at heart. But I also emphasize the fact that I don't think that's the path forward. I don't think that's the way to actually solve some of these issues is to be outspoken in in what it is that your particular identity, what what your needs are, but then to in the same breath hold the belief that you know me or anyone else is incapable of of understanding where you're coming from um, and that I'll never be able to and that you know it's like that doesn't that doesn't set fertile ground for any change to happen so i guess i guess what i would say on all this is is um you know in ways of solution is that it can come from an individual level and this comes from no matter who you are and what what type of um ideas or parts of yourself that you that you hold dear in your identity is that consider yourself so much so much more similar to your fellow human and your fellow citizen than than to focus on the differences right look for look for the good things and look for the similarities because that's the only way that we can even come to the same table to address the differences that's beautiful that's, <laughs> couldn't agree more and that's such a, a great way of putting it and a, a great framing to to remind ourselves of every time we go to address these very challenging issues that we'll continue to address until we solve them hopefully so <laughs> i think that's a good a good place to end because i think that addresses every issue we've we've touched on thank you so much justin uh it's, it's great to always great to talk how can people follow you going forward i know you're going to be moving again and and, and, and you said you're going to be doing a pull-up series going forward i guess now is actually a really exciting time for me to give some type of an update like that i've been uh i've been building a new coaching website it's just coach justin lind.com my last name is l-i-n-d Coach Justin Lind, mm -hmm. and um, it's 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 basically just just a home for everything I do within within the coaching world, and that'll be linked on my Breaking Muscle profile shortly here, and all of that. And um, if I would love to get in touch with anyone that hears this and wants to wants to reach out, this is my favorite stuff to talk about, both all the bigger issue stuff and fitness in general. I will be back in the U.S. in about a month and plan to be moving around. Um, I'm going to be doing some some overland travel, um, basically kind of an extended road trip, and would love to meet as many people as possible and plan to plan to drop in places, do a bit of coaching, do some workshops. Um, so if anyone is interested in 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 hosting me for a kettlebell or handstand workshop, really anywhere in the U.S., our uh, our plans at this point, my partner and I are uh, are are pretty open ended. So if 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 someone feels compelled to uh, want to do some work together, uh, absolutely reach out. And yeah, like you said, on Breaking Muscle, I'm starting the pull-up series. That's um, I'll be concluding the submissions this week, but they'll they'll start uh, publishing in about a week, I think, and we'll probably be mid midway through those by the time this goes live, so you guys can check that out. And yeah, uh, other than that, thank you, Shane. This is this has been a beautiful opportunity to get to connect with you and connect with anyone else that might might find some value in what what we have to say about all this. <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, I hope they do. Well, thanks again, Justin. You take care of yourself over there in tomorrow. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot.